Good morning, everyone. It's a quiet group. We can sort of understand why, I guess. I'm feeling a bit nervous. It's quite, it's quite technical. It's the first time I've, I've led worship with the online service. Welcome to everyone online. Uh, welcome to everybody here. But uh, we're all just praying here. We just, I guess, relax and just focus on God. That that's really what we're here for. We're here for His worship. We're here for His praise. Um, so if you'd like to stand with us, we're going to sing our first song, and it's Bless the Lord, O oh My Soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His This one too slow. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord was Beautiful name is the name of Jesus. 
So we have a new song in our bracket here. I really, really like the words to this song. It's a fairly simple song. Um, try and sing it as you can. Uh, well, just listen to us play it. But um, I really think encourage you to listen to the words and what it has to say. So we'll come to a time of communion. Now, I haven't done communion with a guitar on before, so I'm uh, bear with me for a bit. I'm assuming there's no announcement, not, no other announcement at the moment, but um, okay, we're good to go. Uh, look. As a, as a typically wise and a, a self-reliable Australian man, I think it might surprise you to hear that I have done dumb things in the past. <laughs> you don't agree with me so much. Look, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all the whole list. I just want to recount, I guess, one story as a devotional thought for, um, for communion. You see, I have driven through floodwaters, right? I know all the propaganda... If it's flooded, forget it, blah, 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 blah. Um, but you see, me, unlike other foolish men that have gone before me, 
I'm different. I had a plan. On this particular day, I'd gone to work. Uh, during It was you know, a heavy period of rain. And as the morning progressed, the rain was really kind of flash flood sort of level. It was getting pretty heavy. Um, where I work out past Bow Desert, kind of the site sort of sits, sits up high, but the roads in and out, they're all sort of have creek crossings or they have low sort of floodplains around them. And it's quite common that the site sort of gets um, flooded in for a few, few days, it can be even sometimes when the rain's heavy. So anyways, we were at work and the day progressed, you sort of, the whispers come through work and, and, and it sort of progresses that everyone was saying the roads, they're going under, you know, it's sort of like alarm bells, the road's going under, the road's going under. Everyone hits their cars and drives out because really no one wants to get stuck at work for a long weekend. Um, Really, the message was starting to come through too that actually the roads were under and only bigger cars, the four-wheel drives, were getting through. I kind of had a problem on that day because for whatever reason it was, I'd actually swapped my car with Dana and I had her beloved tiny little buzz box Hyundai i30. Um, it's a tiny little car. So, what to do? Certainly not, not, <laughs> nothing smart. So, I hatched a clever plan, right? So, I had a plan. My engineer, who, who works with me, he had a big, tough old Hilux. Um, and so we agreed to drive out together in convoy, right? I would follow behind his car. His is the larger, bigger, heavier car. It would hit the water, create a wake, make enough sort of gap for me to drive behind, not on dry land, but enough traction to drive through. It's a technique that I do, uh, unfortunately, have to admit that I have used before. So we headed out together in close convoy, the tough old Hilux and my not-so-tough I-30. The rain was heavy, the storm clouds were dark, and it was quite hard to see from the beginning. We got to the first water crossing where the creek had started to rage over the bridge. The young driver in front of me, he pulled up unsure. I remember pushing up behind him saying to myself, look, we go now or never? I was, I was pretty agitated, I wanted to get out of there. So with me kind of urging him from behind, we ran the first water course and the technique worked great. We pushed through to dry land the other side and I felt, I can say, pretty proud of myself and my little trick. We pushed on with the rain howling and the water around the flat area rising. We got to the next water crossing. By this time, it was a floodplain full. It was hard to see the con in the conditions, but there was probably a couple of hundred metres of flowing water across the road. We had come forward, the rain was heavy, the water's risen, we were trapped, there was no going back. This time the young driver, he didn't hesitate. He knew we were in a dire situation and he drove straight in. Now, unfortunately at this point, I had also made maybe another mistake. In the stress of it, I hadn't shifted down the gears in the car. The little i30, it's quite low range in gears normally. You can, you know, you normally sit pretty high in the gears. Um, but I headed into the water in third. So there was the two of us bumper bumper plowing forward into the torrent. The rain was howling, all I could see at this point was just the wipers going full tilt trying to see the tail light of the rusty old Hilux in front of me. As we got further and further in the water, it got deeper and stronger and I could feel the I-30 was starting to lose traction. I could just feel the water starting to take the car. I was slowing down and the engine was starting to lose revs. The bright tail lights of the Hilux started to pull away from me. The situation got darker. Um, and it made the water situation worse because the wake effect was gone. I needed to change the gears, but I knew if I hit the clutch, I was going to lose traction, I was going to lose it all. And if I didn't change gears, the engine was going to stall and I was at the mercy of the floods. And it's at that split second in time that you can see, I guess, an analogy for life. There I was due to the foolish choices and actions that I had made. I was there in the dark all alone with the rain and the floodwaters closing in around me, soon to be lost. And look, I guess it's a place we've all been in life. We all, to various degrees, have had to go out into the night and face the darkness. If we're honest, it is often, not always, but often, that we're in the storms of life. Broken friendships, hurt marriages, addictions, financial woes, whatever it is, we're there due to our own wise actions and choices. But fortunately, the story does have an end. As the driver in front must have seen me starting to flounder, he slowed down to a crawl. The gap between us closed to what must have been only a few centimetres. And as the bright tail lights of his car filled my vision, the wake effect returned just enough to see me clear, and the two of us escaped with hearts in throats and a vow to never, ever do that again. 
And although I'm not wanting to be irreverent to make an analogy between the Lord Jesus and a a rusty old Hilux, it does paint the picture for us that the answer to life's storms is to draw near to Jesus. He is strong and kind. And in his presence, the waters, the floodwaters will flee, the storm goes calm. And and just to close, as we, we come to take the elements for communion, I would read from his word. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. Let's pray as we we come and take out our elements and we'll, we'll sing a song for everybody here. Dear Lord, I just thank you for the image in your word that you are the rock on which we on who we can base our lives. I pray that we would all seek to draw closer to you, to know you more, to let the fears and the challenges and the stresses and the evils of life disappear from us as we come closer as your people, as your disciples. I pray that you would watch over us closely and keep us near to your heart. Uh, Then we will be a people that seek after you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Feel free to come forward and take the elements as we, we sing this next song. fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have
Okay, yeah, thanks so much, Scott and the team. Really appreciate, again, our, our worship leaders and the teams that come in early and, uh, and set up and practice are ready for our worship services. So let me say to all of you, hey, uh, welcome today. Uh, welcome to those of you who are watching from home, watching online from all around the world, especially those in southeast Queensland who might be a little spooked by yesterday's spike in uh, local acquired cases of coronavirus, but also a really warm welcome to those of you who uh, have, are here live and uh, socially distant but united in Christ, united in worship. It is just so good to see your smiling faces as we gather together for worship today. Now, it was interesting. I heard this sound when we were singing the songs. It was the sound of the bass guitar, and I think, and I looked up and I couldn't see the bass guitarist anywhere. Could you see the bass guitarist? And I looked up on, he was hiding behind the stage curtain. So I don't know whether we forgot to open the curtains or whether you're deliberately hiding behind the curtain, uh, Brian, but uh, you know, I could hear the sound, but I couldn't see the sight. Uh, it's good that you're here. And, and thanks, Scott, for, uh, for leading us today. Now, there is a children's program running today. Pastor Chris and our PACE team and our other volunteers are ready to go with kids program. It's called One Way for Kids. So children, you want to head on out, this is the time to go on out with lots of enthusiasm for your age-appropriate learning today as uh, in a little while we're going to dig in to uh, um, Titus chap chapter 1. But a uh, lot's happening around the church. There really is. Not only is Brian hiding behind the curtain, um, not only is Scott driving cars through, you know, flooded creeks, you know, I thought it was if it's flooded, forget it, or something like that. Uh, it's been, there's been a lot of good things happening around the place too. Uh, we we want to say today, and uh, just briefly mention it now, and I might say a little more in the second service, is that Ben Woodley, one of our young adults here at the church, one of our sound guys, he's leaving us. So everyone say, well, uh, so it's the oh, one, two, three, oh, Ben's leaving us. And he is leaving us, and he is leaving Brisbane and Logan, and he is leaving Queensland, and he is leaving Australia, and he is going to Germany because he wants to marry Flo. All right. <laughs> So, Ben, we just want to say as a church, uh, literally leaving, not just for a holiday, he is going to Germany, and he's going to learn German, he's going to study there and get work there, and uh, we'll see what happens next, but, but Ben, we, we really appreciate you. We, uh, I mean, love, um, the things we do for love, whoa, the things we do for love, like walking in the rain and the snow when there's no place to go, and heading off to Germany when you're following flow. But uh, it even rhymes. So good on you, Ben. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much for all you've done, for being part of our fellowship here, for being one of our great uh, sound engineers. Let's thank Ben before he, as he heads off today. All right. Okay, let me run through just a few announcements really quickly for those of you who are here, and even for some of you who are online as well. First is we actually have a praise and worship night tonight at 6 p.m. So we'll be here worshiping and praising God in this, uh, in this environment, and you're welcome to come back at 6 p.m. There's going to be lots of uh, musicians and singers. I'm leading a bracket of songs. Amy's leading some songs. We've got a whole bunch of different musicians from different bands involved in the service. And uh, it's also going to be online. So if you are watching online, you can, you can tune in again tonight at 6 p.m. and sing along to some favorite songs and some new songs. And uh, this is a, a really important time for us as a church to seek God in praise prayer and worship. There's a women's event planned for next Saturday. It's called Brunch with Wendy, my wife, our women's pastor here. And uh, numbers are growing. We know a few, you know, a few people might be spooked a little bit by what's happening. We'll wait and see. At the moment, it's all still on, isn't it? It's going ahead next Saturday at this stage, unless, you know, we get more directions from the health department. So please get your tickets online, uh, and you can find out more about that next Saturday morning. At what time, Wendy? 9.30. All right. Annual reports are out today for our local members. For those of you at home, you can, we can uh, email you a copy if you haven't already got one. There has been a, a copy sent out by email, and you can read those online. Great to read those reports, because our annual meeting is coming up only next Sunday night here at the church at 5 
p.m. So that's next Sunday, 30th of August at 5 p.m. And members are uh, reminded just to cast your vote for the two new elders who have been nominated to join our leadership team. Guys, would you join me in a word of prayer? Oh, Lord God, we really do thank you and praise you that we have the privilege of being able to gather in this place for worship and then to be able to gather across the internet in all parts of the city, state and country and even world to hear from you, to worship you and to join with other believers who share a common faith that we might be strengthened and encouraged and challenged by your word. Lord, before we get into our scriptures today and open the pages of, uh, of the letter that Paul wrote to Titus, Lord, we just want to pause for a moment and pray for our nation. We pray, Lord, for the city of Melbourne, where there has been such a, uh, a big uh, increase over the last few months of coronavirus uh, cases. We pray for families that are bereaved, for people that are in hospital, for, for that city and for the people in Victoria who are facing a pretty severe shutdown. Lord, many of us have family and friends in Melbourne, and so we pray for the people of Melbourne, Victoria, at this time. We pray for the leaders of our nation, the leaders of each state. Grant them wisdom and grace, and Lord, uh, that they might be able to fulfil their duties effectively as unto the Lord. We pray for our church, Lord God, today. We pray for us as we head into an annual meeting, as we start looking toward the future, as we vote on new elders, and we ask, Lord, for your continued hand of guidance and grace and goodness to be upon this church. Might this be so true of us as a local congregation that we would say, along with the words of that last song, that all my life, Lord, you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. We rejoice in the goodness of God. But Lord, as we open your word, we pray, speak to us in Jesus' name. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Those at home said, Amen. All right. In 1955, the Reverend Jim Jones began a Christian ministry in Indianapolis in the USA. The ministry grew on a combination of Christian and socialist ideologies, motivated by quite high ideals such as racial equality and serving the poor. They ran a soup kitchen for thousands and the, the church, the movement, began to grow. In 1959... Jim Jones's church joined with our sister denomination in the USA, the Disciples of Christ or the Christian Church, and it became known for a while as the People's Temple of the Disciples of Christ. But as the years went on, Jim Jones became more and more radical, more unstable. His teaching strayed from its roots as he began to speak against much of the Bible. The movement focused more and more on socialism, uh, it also attracted some high-profile celebrity uh, members. And the event moved from Indiana, it moved its base to California, and eventually to Georgetown, Guyana, in the Caribbean. But on November the 18th, 1978, the world woke, woke to the shocking news that the Reverend Jim Jones had led his followers in a mass suicide, perhaps more appropriately uh, titled a mass murder-suicide, as his followers were all instructed to take a concoction, drinking the Kool-Aid, they call it, a, of, of juice and cyanide, and 918 followers of Jim Jones and the People's Temple died in that one moment. Until the, uh, the events of 9-11, when airplanes flew into the buildings in New York City, this was the largest loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act in history. I want to tell you, leadership 
is a vitally important role. The qualities of the leaders that we are going to follow also need to be very, very good qualities. And we're going to look at that subject today. We need to ensure that we are following leaders of good character, leaders who qualify for their role. And friends, we need to be careful who we follow. We need to be careful which leaders we're going to follow. Well, today we're going to turn to the letter that Paul, the apostle, wrote to Titus, who was on the island of Crete, and Paul was giving Titus some really important tasks to do. This young leader, a convert of Paul, uh, being mentored by the Apostle Paul, had the job of helping to establish churches, to put the church in order, the house in order, to get things done. So we're going to look today at the subject of leadership. We're going to look at the, the qualities of good leaders, and we're going to look at the importance of balance in good and godly. And then we're going to open this up and, uh, and think about it a little more. Think about leadership. Think about who, which leaders am I following? Okay? Think about what, what sort of legacy I'm leading in my life, or, or I, am, I am leaving in my life, for the people that might look up to me as a leader. Because all of us have influence. We're all leaders somewhere in some... It might be at work, it might be in your neighborhood, it might be in your family group. You have influence, you have a leadership capacity. So, think about all of that as we read these words. So, Paul says to Titus... I left you on the island of Crete so that you could complete our work there and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household and so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered he must not be a heavy drinker, violent or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home. And he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Or, the traditional versions, he must hold fast to the faith once delivered. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. Because there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. These teachers must be silenced because they are turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching. And they do it only for money. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said about them, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. This is true, so reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. They must stop listening to Jewish myths and the commands of people who have turned away from the truth. Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny Him by the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing any good. So there are some words there, some, some clear words, some guiding words, but also some strong words for those who are teaching false doctrine. So let's just think about this issue of leadership today. The first point is, uh, the key point, I guess, out of this passage today, is choose your leaders carefully. Choose your leaders carefully. Now, there's a specific 
application to this scripture, but there's also a general application to it. I'll start with the specific and we'll, we'll move to a general application because I think we, we, we get to choose often what sort of leaders we're going to follow. But the specific application for this idea of choosing leaders carefully is uh, an instruction that's been given to, uh, to Titus. And remember that yeah, Paul has left Titus in Crete, given him a job to do. He is to, to put that house in order and to, uh, to literally uh, complete the work that was there. Let's read it in verse 5. I left you on the island of Crete so that you could complete our work there and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. And so this is uh, specifically about the sort of leaders we want in our churches. Now, Titus got to appoint elders, and there are some leaders that are appointed in our modern church world today. We often appoint leaders, uh, you know, from a board or from a senior minister. We might appoint a worship leader. We might appoint a children's leader or a youth pastor. We might appoint someone to look after the playgroup or to take care of Celebrate Recovery, one of our wonderful ministries here at the church. People are often appointed, but when it comes to, uh, in most um, in modern settings, when it comes to leaders of organizations, there is a process involved, and often that process involves nominations, elections, uh, screening, and all of those things. And so we have a process here at Springwood. And we are right in the middle of that process at the moment. As we get to have a say, to have a voice as members of a local church into the sort of leaders that we will follow, the sort of people that we want to see in our church board, people who would be referred to as elders. And uh, so we don't usually get to just appoint them from the top down, but as a as a local body, we have the responsibility of appointing leaders to those roles. In Bible times, people were, became into leadership in lots of different ways. Sometimes God just told them and it was clear. They were appointed or anointed. Sometimes their lots were cast. And uh, that does seem odd to us today, but lots were cast uh, to determine who might take on a position of leadership. And in other times, like in Acts chapter 6, when they were looking for those who would wait on tables, the apostles said to the people, choose from among yourselves men who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And they sort of became the first deacons, if you like, in, uh, we read about in Acts chapter 6. But here in Titus, there are specific instructions prescribed for those who provide the core leadership of a local church those who are referred to as elders, overseers. So the first of the, the instructions is that there ought to be leaders. You know, there are some people in the society who are very anti-leadership. I know of some church groups that don't like the concept of leadership. Everything is so egalitarian that there is no one to step up to be a leader among them. Everything is congregationally decided. Everything is collectively determined. But the Bible says you're to have elders, you're to have those who lead. And the scriptures teach us that leadership is a good thing. It is good to look, even to aspire to a role of leadership. As long as your heart's in the right place and you're following God's word and, you, and you, you're exhibiting the fruit of the spirit, God wants people to step up and to step into leadership. And so we read, for example, in a similar passage in 1 Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 1, where Paul writes to Timothy, who's in Ephesus doing a similar work to Titus over in Crete, in the Greek island of Crete, he says, here is a trustworthy worthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer, another word for elder or church leader, desires a noble task. It's a, it's a good thing to aspire to leadership. It's a good thing to have leaders. And so the first of the instructions, I guess, that we read here is that there ought to be leaders. It's a good thing to be leaders. It's a good thing for us to learn to follow godly appointed leaders and to do so with the right spirit and the right attitude. There's a whole bunch of scriptures about that, about honoring those who serve and who lead and about respecting those who, give, uh, who, who teach and who lead in God's church. But the second is that there should be a plurality of leaders. So there's not just one leader, 
Paul didn't say to Titus, I want you to appoint one boss in every church. I want you to appoint one guy, one guru, one head honcho, one man or woman in each church in Crete. No, no, he said, I want you to appoint elders in the churches. It's all plural. Everywhere you read about elders in the New Testament, there's a plurality of elders. Rather than one person who rules, there is a collective a pooling of wisdom and of the mind and of the minds of a number of people. And for me, when I think of a plurality, you know, at least two or three or more who form a leadership group. It helps to bring more balance. It helps to guard against tyranny and for one person ruling in, uh, in an ungodly way. But there should always be a plurality of elders for the churches, not just one. And the third is that there are clear character requirements for those who serve in this plurality of elders. So we're in this situation right now as a local church. We've got a couple of guys that have been nominated to serve on our board. And, uh, and as, a lo as local members, you know, we're, we're right in the middle of that right now until next week, till, until the AGM. But there are clear character requirements so that we don't follow tyrants like Jim Jones to our own destruction. There are clear instructions given to the type of people that we should look to for leadership. Okay, I'm just going to run through these fairly quickly because basically we see that there, is, it's, there needs to be, we need to follow leaders or choose leaders who demonstrate integrity in a number of areas of life. I want to sort of group these together and to explain these really clear, clearly this morning. Family life. Choose leaders who demonstrate integrity in their family life. An elder must live a blameless life. Now, when it says blameless there, it doesn't mean perfect. Okay? There's no such thing as a perfect person and a perfect Christian or a perfect pastor or a perfect elder. What it's really looking there, that an elder who is placed into a position of leadership in a church should not have a bad reputation whereby blame or accusation can be leveled against that person and the church in the wider community. So it's a general term. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. In fact, I sometimes think we should have a sign out the front that says, no perfect people allowed. So blameless doesn't mean perfect. We don't set a... Uh, a bar for eldership or leadership that is so high that it's unattainable. But there should be integrity in family life, a faithful man to his wife. There should be the, the, the elder should be faithful in marriage. And uh, the, uh, the elder should have a, a good reputation and his children, particularly while they are younger, because eventually everyone gets to choose their own path, to choose their own way. But they should be not, uh, in an obvious way, wild or rebellious in the, the NLT and uh, not have a bad reputation in the community. Again, it's about uh, finding leaders whose uh, family life is not going to bring the work of the Lord into some sort of disrepute. So we try to look for, for, for elders who love their wives, love their kids, family's important, they seek to find balance in their, in their work and their social life and their family life, to be good dads, to be good husbands, to be good partners. And then it says uh, the next area of life is to choose leaders who demonstrate integrity in their social life. And we see both negative and positive um, ways that this is demonstrated in Titus. For example, it says that the, the, uh, the elder must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. So the way they deal with people in their social life, that they are not got that reputation for being a hothead, for being harsh and, and hard-headed and quick-tempered and arrogant. Have you ever followed a leader? Ever, ever had a boss at work who is arrogant and quick-tempered? It's not a lot of fun. It would have been part of a, an organization where the person who is the chairman or the president of the organization is arrogant and quick-tempered and hot-headed, doesn't build harmony, doesn't encourage 
involvement. It pushes people down rather than lifts people up. And so the social life, that which is evident in the conversations of the leader that we choose, should, should, be, should have integrity in their social life. And then it says that he must enjoy having guests in his home. That's a very specific and a very positive um, way of, of saying a similar thing, that there should be, an elder should be someone who reaches out, invites in, welcomes people into the home, is given to hospitality. And so Christian leaders are instructed, therefore, to, to be hospitable, to be welcoming, to invite people home for coffee or a meal or a Bible study or a swim in the pool if you've got one, whatever it might be. But there's opening of the homes. And we know that in, in uh, New Testament times, most of the churches were held in homes. And so it was even more important that the elder, who is a leader in the church, would open his home for hospitality and for church meetings and to allow people to, 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 to gather in their home where they would rub shoulders and, and, and spend time together. And then we also ought to choose leaders who demonstrate integrity in their personal life. And there are some clear personal issues that are raised here. So verses 7b and 8b read like this. He must not be a heavy drinker or violent or dishonest with money. So there's, there's integrity in their personal life, in their lifestyle. He must, on the positive side, he must live wisely and be just. He must have a devout, live a devout and disciplined life. And then the fourth area is that we need to choose leaders who demonstrate integrity in family life, social life, personal life, and of course, in the life of the church, that they would have integrity in their spiritual life. Verse 9 puts it really clearly. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught, that he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. Uh, one of the other passages that talks about eldership says that, a, that an elder should be able to teach. It doesn't mean that they, they're up on the, in the pulpit preaching every week, but they're able to teach people God's word, to show people, encourage people with God's word, but also, you saw there in verse, uh, verse 9, also to show those who oppose good living and good teaching, where they are wrong. So you can use, you know the scriptures to be able to, to guide people when they are wrong as well. So specifically, there are those instructions given as we get to choose the leaders that we will follow. In a general sense, though, we all need to be careful and choose which leaders we will follow. Amen? Because we do choose a plethora of leaders, voices, teachers, and role models in our lives. We follow all, si all, all types of people. We sometimes follow people on social media. That's what you call it when you follow somebody on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. You follow them. And so we, we, we listen to their voice. We see what they have to say. We follow their ideas. In society today, we follow Media personalities, celebrities, politicians, pop stars, self-proclaimed gurus. I mean, anyone can have a voice now, anyone can have a TV channel, anyone can set up a YouTube channel, and people do, and have become famous for the type of teaching or the type of viewpoints that they bring. And so today, more than ever, there are a plethora of voices screaming at you my ideas are right. Come and follow my ideology or my political stance or my brand of doctrine. And we need to be careful the, about the leaders that we choose to believe and to follow, whether in our local community or whether in a bigger sphere uh, of the world and of the media. I remember a song by Amy Grant many years ago where she's, the song just went, you got to choose who to and who not to listen to. you got to choose who to and who not to listen to. Be careful with the sort of leaders that you choose. 
Why don't we consider putting the leaders that we look up to, the, the voices that, that we list here, the people that are, are celebrities in the public sphere, put, put them through that grid of, hey, what's their family life like? Is there integrity in their family life? Is there integrity in their personal life? Or is what they say and the way they live two completely different things? You know? And what about their social life? And what about their spiritual life? Put them through that grid. Or perhaps we could go to Galatians chapter 5 and we could read the fruits of the Spirit. And when we're thinking about the sort of leaders that we look up to politically in our nation or in our world, or the sort of voices that we listen to on our YouTube feed or channel or whatever it might be, and put them through the grid that is mentioned and is known as the fruit of the Spirit. Does this person exhibit love? Do they express joy? Is there a sense of peace in their life? Or kindness, goodness, patience, gentleness, meekness, or self-control? And we put people through a Bible grid to say, is this person a leader that's worthy for me to follow in all sorts of areas of our life? And then we can ask the same question of ourselves again. What sort of leader am I? Is there integrity in my life? For those that are in my family, in my neighborhood, in my workplace, and the club that I'm a member of, as they look to me, am I setting a good example that they might follow? That they might see something of Jesus in me that makes a difference in their life? Okay, well, time gets away when you get carried away with preaching, doesn't it? But the second key point today, and in our passage of Scripture today, was to live and lead with balance. To live and to lead with balance. I haven't got the time to go into this in any great depth. But the last six verses or so of Titus chapter 1 is dealing with a very specific issue. As, uh, as Paul writes to Titus about appointing leaders who know the truth, and hold fast to the truth because he knows that there will be false teachers around. And so those in core leadership roles need to have a good grasp of God's word so that they can live and lead with balance and not go off on some sort of tangent. Verse 10 and 11 says, For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and they deceive people. And the specific area is this is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. Uh, the traditional versions, those of the circumcision sect. And those, this is the group of people. These are the, the people that were teaching you had to observe all of the Jewish customs before you could be a Christian. And so as we know, the, the first Christians came out of Jerusalem, but then the gospel spread into the Gentile world and right now for every corner of the globe. And so uh, many were confused and deceived and they taught deceptively. The Judaizers they were known as. And they were teaching that people had to become Jewish first, which means men had to be circumcised in, 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 uh, in, in the way that was followed by the Jewish people. But Paul was really clear to Titus and said, if there's false teaching, they must be silenced because they are turning whole families away from the truth. So whilst the general issue here is about the Judaizers who are saying you need to observe a whole lot of Jewish laws and customs, and they had thousands of laws and customs, even beyond those that are listed in the scriptures in the Old Testament, it really moves to the issue of legalism, to legalism a rules-based, uh, judgmental religiosity that says that if you're a Christian, you've got to do all these things. And they're not even in the Bible, but you know, you've got to dress this way and you've got to act this way and you can't do this and you, you can't do that. And, and if you do, you get judged and there's a heavy condemnation upon you and you get chilled out and spat out. And that judgmentalism, that religiosity, that religious spirit, that legalism kills church. The Bible says that whilst the, well, the, the, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter of the law. When Christianity just becomes a bunch of rules to follow instead of a grace life filled with the spirit of God to live out abundantly, we lose grip with what is right. And so there needs to be a balance. For years, 
church leaders have had to stand firm against a tide of liberalism and licentiousness. We've had to hold fast to the truth of the gospel in faith, in face, in the face of an attack on the Bible or on Christian values. And this continues. So on the one hand, we're resisting the urge to become like the world, to become licentiousness, to have no standards, to have no guidelines, to abandon the ways that are taught to us in the scripture. But there is that equal but opposite problem on the other side of that spectrum. And that is the legalism that binds us up in a whole bunch of rules and regulations that saps the life out of God's church and out of individuals and actually denies the truth of the gospel which says that it is not by works that we are saved, but by faith and that is by grace, or sorry, by grace and that is through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not faith in Jesus Christ plus living by a whole bunch of rules. But it is um, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ at work in us that changes us from the inside out so that we want to do good things, to respond positively to God's word, to live out our faith with the integrity that comes from knowing the truth as it's recorded here in us, but not the other way around where it's a bunch of pressed down rules for us to live. Friends, I seek to lead a sensible, uncluttered New Testament Christianity. When this tug of war between licentiousness and legalism, that we'd walk a middle road. That we wouldn't accept either of them as true, but a, but a Christ-centered way, where Jesus is central. And so when we're looking at this area of leadership, we need to look to leaders who live and lead with balance. Not extremists, radicals, reactionaries, mavericks, not those given to wild extremes or hot-headed pronouncement or harsh judgmentalism, but to careful, considered, balanced way forward. In our movement, we've used this saying for, for a number of centuries. It's not our own, but I think it's fantastic and it's freeing. You know, in essentials, in a local church, in essentials, there's got to be unity. In non-essentials, there's liberty. And in all things, there should be charity, to get the rhyme, or, or love. It's a great little rhyme that helps us to chart a course forward as a local church. It says, yeah, there's some essential things upon which there is absolute agreement and unity. And we hold fast to that gospel truth. God in three persons. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. There is salvation under no other name under heaven, but the, but the name of Jesus for which we, by which we are saved. Um, there's a core of belief in the person and work of Christ and the authority of the Scriptures that guides us, but we still allow people that liberty, that freedom in some areas of life. And so there's a whole bunch of areas where people can have different opinions. Let's be careful to walk a godly path with that, not a legalistic one. I mean, there's been all sorts of things over the years, the do's and the don'ts, you know, don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance, don't play cards, don't join any club, don't buy raffle tickets, don't go to the movies, don't play cards, don't play sport on Sundays, don't eat meat, don't drink coffee, don't barrack for the Sydney Swans, because they lose nearly every week at the moment, like the Brisbane Broncos. Or in churches, you know, women shouldn't wear jeans in church. Men should wear a jacket when they serve communion. You know, women must wear hats. Men must, men must not wear hats. <laughs> you know, and we can, and there's lots of those things are sensible and common sense, but when we make them a big deal, make those things rules, and, and people can choose, you know, as God ch leads you, there, there's going to be decisions that we're going to make personal stand on. Some of them are based on scriptures. You know, some of them are based on, Scripture, but they're taken too far. You know, um, there are some people that drink, and just an example: some people who drink, and some people take a strong stand against drinking alcohol. But if a person drinks, they must not get drunk with wine. It is prohibited in the Scripture. But the Bible doesn't say that you shouldn't drink at all. 
But there's a, there's a whole weight of knowledge why it's a, good, it's a good decision not to drink. It's just one of about 100 examples that you could give. And we would have diversity in a church like this on issues like that and many others. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, we love one another. And we're going to reason together and work issues through together without legalism. We're going to seek a balanced perspective, not going down the track of liberalism or the track of legalism, but following Jesus in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things love. A sensible, middle-of-the-road, uncluttered New Testament Christianity that in, in avoids crazy extremes. And those extremes sometimes also bring the church into disrepute. There is so much more that I could say, but I want to say one more thing as the band are coming up to lead us in our last song. We're talking about who we're going to follow. We're talking about the sort of leaders that we should choose. How could I not finish this message today without saying, most of all, above everything else, follow Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Look to him as the guide for how you should live and how you should treat people and how, what you should believe. Jesus says, come and follow me. Follow me. Don't just follow mavericks and politicians and celebrities on Facebook. Follow Jesus in real life. Let him be your Lord. And Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy. I should come to him. And Jesus said if I am weak, I should come to him. No one else can be my strength. I should come to him. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus, strong and kind. Thanks, God. Let's sing those words together if you'd all like to stand with us.
thanks everyone for joining us this morning um, and following all the rules for heading out of the building, which I know in detail. Thank you.